Greetings. We are tackling section 5.1 today. Uh, we are going to take a look at this second learning objective, explore differential equations and initial value problems. Uh, actually, first we're going to try to tackle a word problem from the previous uh, piece. We hadn't quite, we spent a lot of time on a couple of introductory examples, but now we'll do everyone's favorite word problem. So, propensity to consume we're going to call that PC, is the fraction of income dedicated to spending as opposed to saving. We're assuming that one of these things, two things happens. Either people spend money or they, they sock it away for another time. Uh, the marginal propensity to consume, MPC, is given by this function, e to the negative 0.8x. We're not claiming this is going to be perfect, but, you know, we'll say for the sake of modeling that this does a good job. MPC is the rate of change in uh, propensity to consume and x is the fraction of income that is disposable, that is, income that you are free to spend as you will, not locked up in some other fashion. So, uh, yeah, just to be careful for a sec how we interpret this word rate, because whenever, maybe you're different than me, but my initial assumption when I picture the rate of change in something is to think about it with respect to time. We're not claiming that this is saying as time goes by, this is what propensity to consume looks like. The input for this function is x, so it's saying Imagine the fraction of disposable income getting bigger, then this is the change in propensity to consume. So as, you, as, you, as we imagine increasing the amount of money people have to, to spend as they will, what happens to propensity to consume? Okay, so uh, propensity to consume is 0.8 when disposable income is 0.92. We're given this little snapshot of information, uh, which, which will probably help us later on. But our task is to find a formula for propensity to consume. So we have MPC, we're supposed to get to PC. So here's our thought process. Uh, we're basically told, we're, it's written in words, so we've got to translate, but that MPC is the rate of change in propensity to consume. But that's what the derivative is. Rate of change in PC would be PC prime, and we're being told that's MPC, which is great. So now we have uh, actually an equation to set up, really. So if we know what the rate of change is and we want to walk that backwards to an actual function, that's exactly what this new tool we've been developing will do for us, anti-differentiation. So we take MPC, we slap on this, this indefinite integral business, and we're, we're off to the races. So it, it, it is a little bit disingenuous to say this is equal to that antiderivative. Um, because this is a whole family of solutions, and in fact we only want one, but yada yada, we'll make it work. Okay, so MPC really is e to the negative 0.8x, so we're just replacing that. And then here we've got that uh, nice exponential rule, uh, not to be confused with power rule, <laughs> which is actually pretty easy to do. Uh, this is essentially k in that formula, so e to the k times x. And what our formula says is, uh, look, you can manage this just by essentially ending up with 1 over k as a multiple, and everything else is untouched. E to the x is really hard to mess with when you do derivatives or antiderivatives because they're, they're basically immortal. They're, they're immune to this operator. Now, you do get little constants that come along and, uh, you know, add to the mix here, but really, e to the x is going to survive here. Now, just, just to uh, step away for a moment, if we wanted to make sure this really did work, uh, that is, we wanted to check our answer, we, we would use this derivative operator we would take the derivative moving backwards because that's what this thing is, is an antiderivative. So we should be able to undo things as we move back and forth. So one thing you could note right away is that this arbitrary constant, which every, I mean, people are going to forget all the time, it's totally a thing that people forget, uh, this plus c, if you take the derivative of a constant, it's going to disappear. So it sort of makes sense that this expression inside doesn't have any constants on it. What is left is e to the stuff, so then we take a look at the, the piece that actually has variables on it, and we say, look, if you've got e to the stuff, uh, the derivative would be uh, e to the stuff still, but times, the, the according to the chain rule, the derivative of this top piece. So the derivative of this exponent would be negative 0.8, it would come out, you'd have a negative 0.8 on top, a negative 0.8 on bottom, those guys would cancel, so no interesting multiple out here. All that would be left is e to the negative 0.8x, which is exactly what's inside of this integral. So take the derivative of this expression. If you get what's inside the integral, mission accomplished. You did your job. 
Okay, just a tiny little bit of tidying. 1 over negative 0 .8, uh, 0.8 is, I'm hoping, negative 1.25. So everything else is, is staying the same. We just kind of tidy the fraction. So what we found is, uh, maybe I'll stay there for just a sec. This is a formula. It's hard to deny that. But if you can picture that for some reason you work for a, a, a company that is interested in knowing what the propensity to consume for some, some demographic is, and they're going to base, they're going to put a lot of money into some advertising campaign that depends on how willing they think people are to buy stuff. Well, you go to your boss and you say, ha ha, I found this propensity to consume function. Look, it's negative 1.25 e to the negative 0.8x plus any other number ever anywhere that you might want. That's, that's probably not a great way to keep your job. Uh, I think if, I, if I, somebody asked me how much was in my bank account and I said, oh, I have $500 plus and any constant, that's not really very useful information. So this is a good stepping stone, though. And, and it works for, for functions that don't have an interpretation like this. OK, you find a general solution. That is one where this constant of integration, this plus C thing, is still hanging out. But really what we want is a particular solution. And what we mean by that is take some, some uh, particular information that we know about propensity to consume and use it to help figure out what C is. So I'm writing this in function notation, but let's scan back just a minute to figure out where this came from. So remember this last sentence in the setup that we basically have ignored up to this point? If the propensity to consume is 0.8 when disposable income is 0.92. Well, okay, so disposable income is 0.92. This is x, remember? x is the fraction of income that's disposable, so they're giving us an x value there. And propensity to consume is 0.8, so here they're giving us a value for uh, PC. So mathifying that, turning it into function notation, PC of 0.92 is 0.8, and that's where we're going to get our uh, that's where we're going to get this function notation from. So right as I mentioned, we're going to use this to solve for the constant of integration. So again. Uh, Here's our general solution, the one where we have this plus C running around. And then uh, here is the actual propensity to consume at this particular point. Here is the X value, the uh, disposable income that got us there. And we're just plugging those values in. Now, if you notice, you scroll through this equation, C is now the only thing we don't know. So we can use this to solve for C. So with a little algebraic manipulation, add 1.25 over. Uh, this is something um, in the order of point, uh, 1.4. I think it's 1.39 something. So, pretty good. Now we have a value for C, though. So our conclusion is, hey, propensity to consume as a function of disposable income should look like this. So this is, this is as, as uh, reliable as the original claim about MPC was. So the more we believe in this e to the negative 0.8, x business, the more we should believe in this whole function too. Well, that's okay though. It's, it's a nice function. Okay, so this would tell us whatever disposable income, what would the, that community's propensity to consume be? Uh, nobody asked us for a graph, but what the heck, let's get a picture in there. Um, basically, what we're measuring on the horizontal axis is this disposable income deal, and they gave us uh, one particular data point. They gave us x equals 0.92, so we can follow my awful little dotted line up here, and then C, kind of verify what our function output thinks it ought to be. And we're close, it's not perfect, but uh, we we're supposed to get 0.8, right? If we had 92% disposable income, then people would spend about 80% of their income. So that, that, that makes some sense, right? If you, if you had uh, only 8% of stuff that was required that you pay, rent, utilities, whatever, and the rest of it you could spend on whatever, you'd probably spend a lot of it, but maybe not all of it. You would, you would still save some. If you notice, there are different situations down for these lower values. For instance, down here is 20% disposable income. So you only you spend 80% on stuff that you have to, and you only got 20% left over. Well, this looks like a problem, because this number is bigger than 0.3. So you have 20% of your income, you're spending more than 30% of it, and that's what we call in the business going into debt. 
so that's an unfortunate situation, but it, it also seems to make a little bit of sense at least. And remember that this 1.4, this, this C that we found, affects the vertical component of this graph. How much, not the shape of it, but how much it's shifted up and down. But that definitely has an impact on our interpretation. Okay, so one additional element we'll talk about in this video. Uh, we'll start our differential equations kind of discussion, um, but we won't finish it till the, the third and final video for 5.1. So a differential equation is, you know, basically its name. Uh, it's an equation, great, and it's got differential stuff in it. So it could have an actual differential. It could have like a dx or a dt. That, that, that works or it could have explicitly a derivative. So a dy dx or dx dt, for instance. And then uh, a thing that ends up being a, a solution, a thing that uh, makes both sides equal to one another is just like in a standard equation is a, is a solution. So one of the big questions in differential equations becomes, how many solutions are there? Do we have just one? Are there lots of things that might work? Do they look different? Uh, and some of these are questions we don't end up having to be super responsible for, but they are kind of they're kind of fun. So the, the first of two types of differential equations we're going to look at in this course is a simple differential equation. I don't, I don't know how, I, sorry about the word simple, that's not really my fault, but um, I don't know, I, I'm not really a fan of definitions that seem to be talking down to people, like simple, it seems so judgy. But anyway, simple differential equation is one that you can write like this. It looks like the derivative of something, so y with respect to x, and then that's equal to an expression on the right side that's all x's. So that's, that's how I'm going to try to interpret this. So the function is just saying there's got to be some stuff on the, the right side that has only x's, not both x's and y's. So if we get one of these, basically the whole deal is over once we anti-differentiate, once we take the, the integral. So we're so, supposed to sort of imagine integrating this whole thing so we integrate a derivative, and that sort of kills it, uh, kills it off and gives you just y. And then we integrate the right side, and that's sort of where the action is. But since all this has x's in it, we're in business. We're getting, we're, we're developing the ability, I won't well, say we've mastered it, but developing the ability to integrate things with x in it. So that's exactly what our job would be on the right side. And actually, we did this exact thing for the propensity to consume example. We said, look. Uh, this thing over here is really the marginal propensity to consume, and if we took its antiderivative, took the antiderivative of this thing, what we'd end up with is exactly uh, the propensity to consume. So this right side is basically everything we were up to there. We undid this derivative uh, with, with uh, the, the indefinite integral, and then we ended up with this general solution, and then we use the specific case that they gave us to come up with this particular solution. So really, literally, the only difference between these two things was this plus C business. So here it was general, so the C was unknown, it's just a whole family of solutions. Here's the particular one that suits the numbers that they gave us. Okay, so there's, there's our first little simple differential equation deal. Maybe we can try one of these guys out. So here is, here is yours to, to give a shot at. Uh, so here's our derivative, and just as a hint, right, this is simple because the right side is all x's, and our strategy for that is to integrate, essentially. And this is one I've, I've showed you the rule, but you may not, we haven't done an explicit example of it yet. So you have to think, uh, how do I find the integral of 3 over x? So I'll let you have a shot at that, and I'll see you in the next video.